So the last topic we talk. So the last topic we talk about how matter cycles through the ecosystem and going to be flowing through ecosystems, and we also established that the fact that there are limits to the sizes of food chains and food webs and things like that because of the way that energy uh, gets uh, less and less uh, useful as it goes up the levels of the food web, and the majority of the energy gets uh, wasted as as heat or used up as work. Now. In this video, I want to talk about some things that happen sometimes to ecosystems that can affect the, the quality of the ecosystem and then send uh, have effects on the food web. The first thing I want to talk about is about extinctions. And let's say, for example, that you were to delete the top-level carnivore in the food chain that you see over here. So you, you kill off the hawk. Now, if you do that, um, what's going to happen is that there's going to be more of this snake because the snake now is going to be... a uh, available more since it's not being eaten but since the snake is not being eaten you're gonna have less of, of this one so the numbers of this one are gonna go down even though the number of this one went up but if the numbers of this one went down then the numbers of this herbivore will go up right which means the number of producers will go down right so you see how that works but then if the producers won't go down that means that that less herbivores will be uh, uh, able to eat which means then this number will go down but then that means that this number will go down too, and then this number will go down too, and then, do you see what I'm saying? This is what we call cascade effects, or the idea that you do something to, to the food web, it will send reverberating effects to, to the everything. Think about it, for example, let's pick a random animal over here. Let's look at this, uh, uh, let's look, let's kill off the zooplankton, right? So this organism right there that I highlighted, it's dead. Now, if you did this, the number of the algae over here that gets eaten by the zooplankton will increase. And so uh, that means that they're going to be available more, right? Now, it, if you notice then that people that eat the zooplankton, though, will actually have uh, problems now. So that this plankton-eating fish will start to die off, which means their heron will have trouble eating, eating now. So it may be affected a little bit. Or it might start eating this guy more. That means that these numbers are going to be going down as well. And then that means that this number of this will go up. The, the grass will go up because now you have less of the, of the mussels which ate it. And, but this, if that's true, you have the grass here too. If this grass is going up, now, now that means there's more food available for things like the sand hopper. So now he, this number of it, of it goes up. The grasshoppers will go up as well. The harvest mouse will go up as well. But, you know, and then that means this goes up and this goes up and that goes up. But if they go up, then do you understand what I'm talking about? This, this is very complex. And in fact, it's very hard to predict what actually happens to the, to the food web if any one thing happens. But one thing is for sure. The food web is affected when animals go extinct. It sends cascade effects throughout the food web. Now, the opposite is also true. If you were to introduce a new species to this, it would also affect things. If you were, say, for example, introduce an, what we call an invasive species, which is a species that doesn't really belong here. Let's say we stick in here a human being. He's not really supposed to be in this ecosystem, but now we put him in there. And now the thing is that this guy is crazy. He's cray cray. He eats everybody and nothing eats him. What's going to happen to this food web? Well, of course, no one can compete with the humans, so what happens is that the numbers of humans are going to go like up like crazy. Meanwhile, the numbers of everything else will probably suffer in the ecosystem. Another example of that here in Florida is when you, um, the, you people will have this monthly python. It's like a big snake, and they, and they like it for a pet, but then they get too big, and they get tired of it. They release it in the wild, and then the this, this snake finds itself with plenty of food and no natural competitors. Now, nothing eats it, nothing eats better than it does, and so what happens is that the, the pythons start multiplying like crazy and the other animals in the ecosystem start to going down. The same thing is true when you plant a tree which doesn't really belong in the ecosystem where you live, and then all of a sudden this tree finds itself without a competitor. It, it can outcompete all the other trees in the, in the neighborhood, and before you know it, the this landscape is completely dominated by this new kind of tree. Oh, oh, I like that tree, it's a beautiful tree, let me plant it on my backyard. You should think about that when you're deciding to build the plant things, if, if you ever have the opportunity in your life. Plant local trees, because if you plant a tree that doesn't belong to that area, you're basically introducing an invasive species, and trees have seeds that can spread everywhere, and before you know it, you, you're damaging the ecosystem just because of one tree that you planted. And then the animals will be without the trees that they actually need to survive, and before you know it, they will all die off. So invasive species will have 
terrible effects on the food webs for two reasons. First, because they typically outcompete everything that there is there. Uh, and also because they may not have natural predators, which means they can grow up as much as they can in, the, in their, their numbers. So invasive species is, is the opposite of extinctions, and they also send cascade effects throughout the food web. Uh, when you're talking about this, these changes that happen to the food web, there's two types of control that could happen. Uh, you can mess with the top or you can mess with the bottom. Uh, the, one example of top-bottom control is what we talked about. If you, if you were to decrease the number of, 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 of a top predator, what happens is that this is going to increase the number of whoever is right below it. So it's actually important in, in, in environmental science because if you say, for example, we want to in increase the number of deer, the best way to do that is to curb the number of whatever is eating the deer. And so if there's too many predators, if you decrease those predators, then you will increase the numbers of the, the prey because of that. So this is an example of top-bottom control, which actually environmental scientists use sometimes to help fix what the humans did to the ecosystem. Uh, all right. Now, remember, though, that's very dangerous because you saw what happened with cascade effects. It's unpredictable. Sometimes there's so many relationships within the food web that you do one little thing, you can, you can, you can change drastically the food web because of it. There's also bottom-up control, and that's when you mess with the number of producers. If you were to increase the number of producers, what happens to the rest of the food chain? It all goes up because the more productivity you have down here, the more uh, diversity it's allowed up there. Remember, it's the whole thing about the pyramids. Pyramids are maintained by a very big base. So the bigger the base, the bigger the pyramid can be. You can't have an upside-down pyramid because that's what that's going to do is that these animals up there are going to be lacking resources and are going to start to die off. And eventually, what's going to happen is you're going to end up erasing and making a smaller pyramid uh, off of that because you didn't have enough to sustain all the top predators. Which means another type of control that you can do is if you reduce the amount of the bottom here, what happens to the rest, everything goes down as well. So that's called bottom-up control when you mess with the production of the bottom and that also sends cascade effects towards the top of the food web. We'll talk more about this when we do population ecology, that anything that affects the things that the producers need will also send those bottom-up effects. If you reduce the number of nutrients, for example, then you're going to mess with the amounts of producers. And if you increase the amount of nutrients, you're going to mess with the amount of producers. You're going to have more producers. So the nutrient, the producers rely on those nutrients. So uh, that can also generate cascade effects if you mess with the amount of nutrients. All right, that's the most bottom uh, level that you can mess with that. By the way, removing the top predator will actually sometimes increase the diversity of the ecosystem, at least in the short run, because what it would do is it, it will open up the niche on the top for new predators to take its place. And in fact, also the prey, which was no longer under the pressure of the predator, will allow itself to expand and maybe go into new niches, which there wasn't going before because the predators were putting pressure on them. Now, although it's true that predator-prey relationships, and we'll talk about that when we do community ecology, sometimes help establish new cool looks in nature, which does increase diversity. They tend to specialize those new looks. But without the predator, the prey is free to diversify as much as possible because it's no longer under pressure for the predator. It's kind of like the same thing that happens when there's a lot of productivity. The same thing is true about removing things from the top. You also make more energy be available for a more let when less effort it has to be taken to avoid being eaten so either if you increase the bottom energy in the bottom or you increase what's available at the top uh, you will increase the diversity of the ecosystem to a point of course remember that too much productivity could also increase competition and cause a problem and too little predation could also be a problem because then you don't have any pressure from the ecosystem and then the organisms stop changing because of that so you know too little too much of anything in too little of anything is always a problem in nature